Go. We're on with another episode of the Docs Talks. <laughs> Happy we have Wednesday. Multiple Docs. We Here's have, the third. <laughs> and apparently, Doctor Wood didn't get the uh, memo. The it's memo. purple memo day. That's uh, why I'm sitting in the middle. So yeah. it kind of sandwiched in between. <laughs> we're here, Doctor Wood, Doctor Couples, Doctor Booth, myself, and we're going to talk a little bit about rotational power. So, what is rotational power, Doctor Wood? Well, let's see. Are we going to nerd out on rotational power right now? A little bit. Let's I think it. so. Well, we're going to get <laughs> rotational power is how fast you can rotate or how fast you can move an object around an access point or a point of access. So, picking a point, whether it's the body, whether it's anchor down point, we're trying to move that object as fast as we can within a certain angle and create. Uh, Create as much speed, there speed as much. Uh, we're trying to create the biggest energy potential we possibly can. Okay, so going around a point. So uh, last week we we spoke a little bit about creating power upwards or mm -hmm. forwards, like in a line. And this one's kind of uh, what's called curvilinear. That's, uh, that's real <laughs> sciency, but uh, accelerating around a curve. Um, so rotational power. Um, Good. So uh, examples of power, uh, when we look at power compared to strength, we spoke again a little bit about this last week. Uh, we have tons of people that can create tons of like strength. So someone lifting 600 pounds off the ground is a really good example of being strong. Now that's probably not a very good example of power though, um, because it's not moving fast. Uh, it's not happening with uh, the intent to move that fast, it's just with the intent to move it. Um, so when we look at rotational power, um, we're seeing how fast we can move something, not just moving it from point A to point B, how fast point A to point B happens. Um, so when we look at uh, this stuff, that's what we're looking at, speed and acceleration. So what areas in our body um, are responsible for creating rotational power? Uh, the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> All of the above. All of the above. Here to here. Yes, right? because your entire body is involved in the rotational process. Yeah. So, you know, for example, if we, if we look at golf, uh, the big thing that generates a lot of power when you're changing directions in the swing is your feet. So you're pushing with your feet. That creates some rotation up through the, uh, this is not a leg obviously, <laughs> but the leg up here, which then goes into the hips, which then goes in the trunk, neck, arms, everything. So it, it really is the entire body and the degree at which one area is gonna get used more so than another is gonna be dependent on the, the movement itself. So, yeah. so when uh, Chubbs Peterson said it was all in the hips, he was kind of just a little bit off. Yeah, well, yeah. but he also had, probably had to use more hips because he was laughing at our motion. Um, yeah, but the, the, the hips are an important thing. But let's say you're someone who has Great. really flat feet. That might limit your ability to transmit force through the hips because you can't, the way you're contacting the ground is going to be different compared to someone who maybe has a more dynamic foot type. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, you got to look at the whole chain. I think that's what the, the point was going to be driven here is we got to look in, at the entire body as a whip and then there's going to be certain areas that maybe accelerate the rotation a little bit more and then some that transmit force to another area that will that'll, uh, get more rotation in it. So uh, when we typically assess uh, a patient or even clients in the, on the performance and gym side of things, uh, we classify joints um, with different responsibilities or different parameters on what they where they should move a lot or maybe move a little or in different planes. Uh, so looking at the the ankle, we have you know it's a pretty dynamic joint. It can go up and down. It can go side to side. It can rotate and do all that stuff. Uh, that's a pretty it's a pretty uh, important joint to create. Start creating a little bit of that rotation. Um, in a little bit, but, uh, in, in comparison to the foot, like the, the foot is, is a, a stable force or stable uh, point, and then we want to be able to rotate the ankle joint a little bit more than the foot. Um, but it's, the foot needs to be that, that pillar that we rotate on. Then next up, we're looking at a knee. Knee doesn't have a ton of rotation that it should be doing, hopefully it doesn't. <laughs> um, but 
again, that's that's uh, it kind of stacks on top of each other. So we have an ankle that uh, needs to rotate. We have a knee that stays pretty stable, but uh, still needs to transmit a lot of uh, force through it. And then we go up to a uh, hip joint. Again, you know, yep. this is it, the hopefully you guys are following that. That's the hip uh, of the foot, arm. Ankle, knee, and then hip. Uh, hip is very, very, very big for creating rotation, and we can keep on going through the chain. Sorry, yeah. I'm kind of speaking over. Oh no, points. you're doing you're doing great. <laughs> Just keep rolling with it. But uh, especially when you're looking at all the different sports, uh, you're looking at a variation between land-based also and non-land-based sports. And even with some land-based sports where you're actually looking at initiating a lot, of that, uh, a lot of that rotational force for grounding, for when you ground down for the foot and just make your way up through the chain. Uh, certain sports, uh, especially take, for instance, volleyball. Volleyball, uh, especially when you're looking to get a lot of rotational force through hitting a ball, there's times where you're going to be in the air and you're not going to have that grounding force. You're going to be having to deliver that force mainly through the core and hips in the air, as well as in swimming where you're actually looking at more of a balance with the feet. When you're kicking, you're actually looking at also getting that force generated through the hips and the core uh, coming up through the, the rest of the body or coming down through the uh, legs down to the feet. Mm. That's kind of like we talked about with the flutter kick mm -hmm. when you were saying you wanted the hips to kind of do this mm -hmm. little alternating rotational mm -hmm. thing. So really that kind of whips the rest of the body up to one direction and then you transmit with yeah. the arms to go mm -hmm. the other way. Yeah, yeah exactly. so you stop the momentum so it's like you you thrust into one direction, then you have to stop and go the opposite direction. That's where you get your grounding potentially. Um, so if you have a comparison between a, a golf swing or a, a flutter kick, um, the golf swing maybe starts with the foot and comes up, and maybe the, the swimming flutter kick goes the the kick goes the in middle. It'll go from middle down to the opposite yeah. direction, okay. or from the trunk down to the opposite direction. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, major players. Uh, like we're kind of going through, we had uh, ankle and hip are big rotators. Uh, upper back is, is built for a lot of rotation. Shoulders, uh, they can definitely have a lot of rotations in them as well. Uh, but everything has a responsibility. It goes through the, the entire kinetic chain um, just in, in terms of power. So uh, what types of athletes need rotational power? I think that's D, D, all of the yeah, above. the answer is yes. <laughs> so we have a lot of, got, of all of the above answers today. So if you guys are taking the quiz, uh, should have a lot of D, all of the above. Um, yeah. so it's the feet, it's it's all athletes. Yeah. Um, so and even if you're mean? someone who runs. Yeah. Um, even though I think when we're, we're talking about rotational athletes, many of us think people who are throwing stuff, golf, things like that. But even when you're doing something like sprinting, or walking for that matter, there is a alternating rotation of your, your legs going one direction and then your trunk goes the other, so you stay upright. And, and that's totally normal and that should happen. So if you're someone who is just a, a, an avid walker, you would benefit from rotational power activities because your body rotates as you move. We are rotational creatures. Mm -hmm. Now, do you need as much as the, the throwing athlete? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But you can still get some benefit by working your ability to produce power in multiple directions. Yeah, efficiency would be something you'd be striving for there Absolutely. more than anything else. Um, you, know, you wouldn't want to be you know, sloppy at your end ranges when you have to go for a, a kick and a run. You know? mm -hmm. um, you'd still want to be able to control those end ranges. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, so when we look at uh, the athlete of life, how would that, how would, how would we, how would we, kind of uh, teach them or, or teach them the, the need for training rotational power? Well, let's see here, the athlete of life, I'd have to say, got to go, got to give a shout out to a lot of our blue collared workers, especially those that are in the trenches, digging, uh, moving dirt, they're going to have to be able to ground themselves. They're going to have to be able to ro uh, drive that force from the feet all the way up through the body, especially when they're driving down uh, digging, uh, just basically uh, anything they can just to be able to get earth to move. Okay. So especially if they're just going to be not using that rotational force from the feet up, they're going to find themselves overuse, getting 
more overuse, uh, overworking of the upper body, and that's when a lot of the injuries happen, especially for them. And then they won't be able to get in that work or yeah. put food what on the you, table. What do you think about uh, <laughs> training rotational power for the athlete of life? For the athlete, athlete of life. life. Sounds like a good YouTube channel name. <laughs> yeah, it's a good life. vitamin or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. Um, well, uh, some examples we were talking about off camera, we talk a lot off camera, is uh, if you're someone who, if we go back to walking and let's say you trip and you fall, maybe you're, you're an avid hiker and you trip over a rock and it's not in the straight direction that you're going and you fall this way. Well, um, your ability to control that rotation and change direction quickly so you can maintain upright is very important. And same thing if you're someone who's a bit older and your balance has not been as good as it used to be, power is of the utmost importance to keeping you upright. Because a lot of times it's not, it's not a balance issue, right? Because we all battle with getting knocked off of our, our feet in one way or another. You know, gravity's trying to do that to us all day, every day. Gravity's keeping us down. <laughs> but, but the key is, is if you get knocked off of balance, can you recover from that? as quickly as possible to stay upright. And that's where rotational power is really effective. Yeah. Because many times we might fall to the side. And the faster you can get yourself back into the course corrected middle, well then you're at a lower risk for falls. Yeah. And if you can prevent falls, especially the older you get, uh, the, the better that is for extending your lifespan for as long as possible. Because one of the, the, uh, the, the, the ways that many people die as they get older or is after a fall. Yeah. So you fracture a hip, then you're not moving as much, and that increases your risk of all-cause mortality from a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So power is important, not just for moving well in here or at your sport, but for life. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think uh, changing direction is another thing to mm -hmm. think about there. You know, if you're on said path to down the hall and you're in an office and all of a sudden you know someone steps out of their office and you gotta change direction you yeah. don't want to spill someone's coffee on them mm. hey, that is rotational power that is legit rotational power you have to stop change direction yes. that is you know again this is just stuff that rolls through my mind or, <laughs> yeah i'm thinking of you're at the grocery store you see someone and you don't want to talk to them uh, <laughs> you gotta change direction quick happens of the utmost importance Serious uh, social, just, social skills there. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It can really make your social life easier. On I always you. make sure when I go home, I'm just terrible, but I hate talking to people I haven't talked to in years. Like, especially if it's <laughs> hey. high school, I haven't seen you in 10 years. What's new? Well, Everything. it's been 10 years, yeah. <laughs> so I make sure to do extra power training before I go home, just so I can make that quick change of direction. Get your neurologic system story. ready for yep. power. Yep. I get it. Yep. That's right. You've been turning off those Facebook friends. <laughs> <with those savages. laughs> yeah. That I'm okay with. But yeah. All right. So uh, we've looked at types of athletes that need it. Anybody that is breathing basically needs rotational uh, power, but mm -hmm. there's you know context on why. So we gave it a, a little bit of context on some of that. Um, how do we maximize rotational power? What is our, what's our tools for maximizing power? Well, first, we just got to make sure and give a proper assessment of a person's body. We have to see where their mobility strengths and weaknesses are going to lie from basically top to bottom, especially covering all the areas that we just went through from the foot all the way up through the hands. Good. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, huge. We, we base everything we do at Elevate off of assessments and making sure that we understand a little bit more about the body. Uh, we grade those baselines, we treat, we train, we do performance uh, stuff that's going to help with those baselines and then we retest, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's no different than any other uh, skill that we're trying to acquire, whether it's um, you know trying to build a better swing, um, trying to get out of pain, all of those things uh, need an assessment driven first and then after that, then we can start making some, uh, some game plans. Because the reason why someone may be lacking in power could be different for all three of us. So, you know, for example, if we took something that had a little bit of flexibility that we could let go and boom. So, you know, you're tired of wearing your mask, you know, fling it at someone. Don't do that, for love God. <laughs> but you have to be able to stretch the, the, the elastic component of the mask and then there's a stopping point and then you have to be able to let go and that's what creates 
this moving fast. Our bodies work very similarly. And some people might not be super flexible, so their stretching capabilities aren't so great. Mm -hmm. We might have to work on things to enhance that. Some people may have a hard time changing from that stretch position to going in the direction that they want. That's also another area that we could work on. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes people might have stretching skills like, well, they can change direction, but they can't <laughs> push out of it. Yeah. And that's where maybe some of the strength-based work that we've talked mm -hmm. about where some people, maybe it's good to be strong, but it's not powerful, but that's where that could be important. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think you learn how to maybe position yourself for that, right? So if we're, if we're talking about, uh, if we're talking about a maybe a lateral lunge, how about a lateral lunge? If we're holding our uh, uh, maybe a load in front of us, meaning a kettlebell, dumbbell, whatever it is, and we're doing a lateral lunge, I mean we're stepping to the side and then we're changing direction, going back uh, mm -hmm. the other way. Um, we could think of that as rotational strength, and then if you get good at that, understanding how to create tension and load, now you can create that and then start accelerating it and creating rotational power, working on the yep. speed aspect of it, then that turns into throwing a ball. But it goes in a progression. If you can't do a, maybe a lateral lunge and you just feel like you're you know, goopy all over the place and you can't hold something with some stiffness or tension, mm -hmm. um, we're not gonna try to accelerate you at that point. We're not gonna try to move faster mm -hmm. um, because we just don't have the capabilities to do that yet. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, position and coordination is, is key. Practice coordination and repetition. Those are going to be the big things. You always hear the phrases that practice makes perfect. Well, perfect practice makes perfect. So in order to have that perfect practice, you have to work on coordinating all the skills, whether it's literally going to be from learning how to plant, learning how to twist with the hips, learning how to explode and open up. You have to do that process over and over and over and over and over and over again before it becomes starts to become more autonomous because if you're not practicing that right repetition or not practicing that right coordination that's when like you said when it gets goopy things start falling apart and then you start getting unnecessary forces through certain joints that's where some of the major issues with injuries start happening that sideline a lot of athletes hmm. okay so that segues us into uh, what injuries to consider here um, what kind of what kind of stuff are we looking at, and, and why? Why is maybe a power-based movements a little bit more risky sometimes for um, for some injuries? Wait, why is power-based <laughs> movement risky for injuries? Because yeah. you are uh, think of it this way: if you had to get in a car accident, would you rather have it be at 15 miles an hour or 65 miles an hour? Depends on how crazy you are. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. I'm a little bit more risk averse. I would go with the 15 mile an hour car. And the reason why is because the faster you, you move in that scenario, things are more likely to go awry. If we look at that from a body perspective, the faster you're moving, the harder your tissues in your body has to work to be able to produce that. Mm -hmm. And so if there's more force going through your body, uh, the tissues are gonna be closer to their, their failure point, or at least they could potentially be. Especially if you're producing a lot of force one direction and then at the last second you're like, oh snap, I'm actually supposed to go this way. And, and then snap. you try to go the other way. So now you got a large amount of force, a change in the, the rotational action that was initially there, problems. Yeah. So that's why with great power comes great responsibility. And we want to make sure that we can control the, this power and, and try to make it as efficient as possible like we talked about with mm -hmm. golf a couple weeks back. Um, among other things, making sure our, our tissues and our body is strong within the directions that we're trying to move. Yeah, and I think that speaks a little bit to our our programming philosophy, philosophies. Uh, you want to have a lot of awareness during those, right? You want to be very, very focused, dialed in uh, for training rotational power, training power in general. Um, so you warm your tissues up. Um, we talked about a warm up. Uh, watch that a cup from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, talked about a proper warm-up, getting all the, the body ready for uh, training power, but we don't want to fatigue the body out to where we've done our, our strength sets and we've done all this stuff and at the very end we're doing power. That would, that would probably create not the best scenario for the body to create power because we've done all these other strength moves first. 
So in a programming world, we would want to warm up the body, and then when the body's nice and warm, meaning you're, you're sweating a little bit, then it would be a really good time to start creating some power, start training that power, because you have the most amount of decisions you can still make, or the, the coordination and the function is very, very high at that point. So mm -hmm. that's typically where we do it. We do it at the front end of our training uh, programs is, is power-based movements. And then we're also going to look at speaking to the initial positions of originally initiating that amount of power. If you're actually going to be putting or grounding all of your body force into a certain point, whether it's grounding it into the foot, um, if you're not being able to properly put your center mass or put your center mass of your body over that area, you're going to be losing a lot of that power right from the get-go. And then if you're also putting that center, center of mass, whether it's in the outside or the inside, then there's going to be the serious potential for injury no matter how good the coordination is with the rest of the body. Yeah, so again, speaking to like those, those strength-based movements, if we can coordinate those and it looks like the initial movement of the power movement, mm -hmm. um, it might come with a little bit more success later on if we, if we own the strength movements. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's being able to reproduce the technique that you want in as many different scenarios as possible. So you might do it statically during and, and dynamically at a low intensity during the warm-up. You might do it hard during the, the power section. You might be moving heavy weight during the strength section in the same direction yeah. and then conditioning for a longer period of time. Yeah. And so the more you can demonstrate competency in a given movement that's important to you, uh, the more likely you are to be resilient when you're, you're put to the test. Mm -hmm. So two best implements for uh, creating rotational power. What are your two favorite go-to implements, meaning tools? What do you like? Well. With me, I always like to start with the core. So especially if I'm working with the core, I'm going to be working anything from even simple planking and side bridge to working on light Russian twists to med ball throws. Okay. Um, Z, what do you like? What's your what's your That's a tough one? What's two two most popular things that you would probably put into a program? Yeah, yeah. Number one would be med ball throws without a doubt. They just have a lot of versatility and you can progress them for a very long period of time. And, and the cool thing about them too is you can change your stance um, to suit whatever your competency is movement-wise but also to um, to maximize transfer to whatever sport you're trying to do. So you know, if you're a, a pitcher, we can maybe not necessarily set up in the pitch position and throw the med ball, but we can at least work on you moving in that direction as part of your throw. Yeah. And that can be quite effective. Uh, the other thing I like is um, I'm, I'm a big fan of doing like various chops and lift variations. So you get the cable cable system or if you're at home and you got some bands because mm -hmm. you've built up your home gym because of COVID, you're moving the band in various diagonals and rotations in that regard. So you're moving at in a rotational aspect fast and then you're learning to control the motion and move smoothly and in various positions. And you can you can work those or progress those hand in hand. So I might start someone their first program with just seated med ball throws and seated chops and lifts. Mm -hmm. And then that can progress to maybe a half kneeling, to a split stance, to a single leg. So there's a there's a lot of variety that you can get with both of those moves. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't think there's any uh there's no limit on tools and all that stuff. You just have to fit, have, have the context for mm -hmm. uh, creating power. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if you have no equipment, there's tons of body weight uh, variation we can do here. I've, I've programmed tons of split squat jumps, tons of uh, uh, multi-directional uh, jumps where you, you need to jump forward and then immediately jump to a different location. So an L jump, you're going forward and then jump, jumping to the side. Um, those are very good for uh, coordination and, and you can grade those. You can make it a, like a, a foot jump forward or you can make it a three foot jump forward and trying to get you know as, mu as much space as you can. Land and then make it a max jump to the side. Um, those are good variations for uh, creating rotational, rotational power um, and practicing some of that stuff. Um, 
but don't don't uh, think that you need the, all this crazy equipment. You don't need cables if you don't have them. Uh, we have them, so if you need them, mm -hmm. come check it out. Seven zero two five five eight two one five one. There, there it is. Uh, <laughs> that was too early. That was, that was, <laughs> it's never too early. Uh, never too early. Even working on simple rotational mobility. So even if you want to incorporate something just with like a, a reverse single, a reverse single leg lunge, just with mm -hmm. uh, opening up the torso. Just there's simple things to just even work on the basic coordination first before you even start taking a med ball and starting to try to throw it. Yeah, I mean, that's a, I think that those are definitely good things to add in for prep. So when you look at, if you're training rotational power that day, you'd probably want to do something rotational in your warm-up to, mm -hmm. you know, challenge those tissues and challenge the body to to start seeing what it end, what its end ranges are. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely a good one. So mm -hmm. um, One other thing, it's not really gym-related, but if you're not playing a rotational sport, you could always pick that up, and that's a great way to work on rotational yeah. power. I mean, if you look at elite athletes in any domain, most of them, maybe football is the exception, don't get to that level by just spending their time in the weight room. Although we think it's important, and it is important, because I think they can extend your career among other things. But if you're not one to rotate much and you decide to pick up tennis, and you play a lot of tennis, guess what? You're going to get more... Bet mo better rotational power. You can enhance that by coming into the gym as well. So I, I think it's just important to find any activity that you can. Yeah. You know, especially if you're someone who wants to spend more time outdoors, you can still build power that way. Yeah. I mean, if you want to start getting your ping pong shot down. Boom. Mm. Or spike ball. Or spike ball. You start throwing yeah. a med ball into the wall, and you're Kelsey like, man, I do, got some, I do got some power. Yeah. I, got, I, I can kind of explore, and then you might find you might be a a powerful athlete so mm -hmm. it's all got to be uh, challenged and tried and and then you can understand your true potential mm -hmm. your true potential I feel inspired do you would you got anything else for rotational power Ooh, well it's, it's all about learning how to generate that power for me from that center of mass and tomorrow I definitely will be working on my center of mass it's <laughs> pre Thanksgiving right now we are gonna be yeah. Uh, grounding ourselves yes. a little bit. We're gonna work on the the stretching component uh, of the of the power. Uh, so yes. we're, to our stomachs, though. So just <laughs> fill it up as much as you Powerful can. Stomachs. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, if you guys have any questions on rotational power, how to create it, how to program it, uh, who needs it, how you can train it, we're your guys to to ask those questions to. We have a team here built ready for you. If you have any questions? Now say the number. 702-558-2151. One more time. 702-558-2151. Just like in the uh, commercials. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They do it multiple times. So three. we should do it. It's always three. Okay, well we did it three times. We did it. That's, we did. That was yeah. the charm. So if you remember it, comment below. All right, guys. <laughs> if you have any questions, reach out. See you guys next week.